realize we are celebrating now not only the general relativity centenary, but there is another centenary, and that is the 100th birthday of Peter Bergman. And the next talk will be devoted to, to it, and the lecturer, Donald Salisbury from Austin College, Texas, and the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin. The last time uh, I met Don, we walked from the restaurant to the institute, and he told me a lot about Peter Bergman. <coughs> this morning he promised to tell me much more, so I'm looking forward to that. But just in passing, let me mention to you, uh, Don, that, and to everybody else, that in 1979, we marked another centenary, and that was Einstein's 100th birthday, and on that occasion, here in Jerusalem, under the auspices of the Israeli Academy of Science, Gerald Holton and the late Yehuda Elkanah organized another such conference, and Peter Bergman was one of the speakers, and I even remember what he talked about. He talked about Einstein's quest for a unified field theory. So now, Don, it's your turn. Thank you. Let me let me first manage to get that displayed up on the screen. Let me see. Okay. I I would also like to thank the organizers for inviting me to 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 speak at this at this meeting. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Is it, uh, if I don't see a hand in the back, that means no. Okay. Okay. Um, and I I am also grateful that the organizers were were. Um, uh, happy with the idea that we could use this occasion to, to celebrate another 100-year anniversary, namely that of, of the birth of Peter Bergman. Um, of course, this is not directly related to the Einstein centennial, although, as, as most of you know, Peter Bergman was an assistant of Albert Einstein at uh, Princeton University from 1936 to 1941, so there, there certainly is a link. Um, Um, I want to first to explain a little bit about the about the title. In fact, this is closely related to uh, something that ha Hanach just just told us. That um, uh, I'm re actually based the title on on a talk which Peter actually gave here in Jerusalem in 1979. And in fact, this is this is the the first page of that very short paper that he wrote, in which he referred to the fading world view. And, uh, and I, I want to make this some, something of a centerpiece uh, of this talk. Uh, and it's especially appropriate since it was a talk that was actually given here in Jerusalem. Um, so I, I will explain uh, later on uh, in what sense uh, I maintain that, that uh, Peter Bergman um, uh, has had an effect on the history of general relativity, which I, which I think will be permanent and certainly not, not long forgotten. And, um, I, I must also apologize for the fact that I'm neither an historian nor a philosopher. Both of those so, uh, ideas will become readily apparent to you as I as I as I talk. Um, um, and in fact, what I'm mainly going to do is to uh, lay out uh, some facts dealing with uh, Peter Bergman's life, uh, with his early childhood, uh, with uh, with his first experience with Einstein, uh, then. Uh, uh, research which he undertook at Syracuse University in collaboration with many other uh, well-known figures in, in the relativity community. And then finally I want to, to talk about, about the prominent role that he played uh, in the 1950s, 60s, into the 70s in, uh, in uh, helping to organize an international relativity community. So um, we're definitely going to talk about uh, Bergman in context here, and uh, um, I've already given you a brief overview of what uh, the things I want to talk about, but here's, here's a slightly longer version. By the way, I'm going to try to cut this a little bit short so that we will certainly have time to be able to get to dinner at Yamima's house this evening, so I'm, I'm aiming for 40 minutes or so. Okay. Um, so. Um, First, I'll mention uh, the the fact that Einstein, that uh, Bergman was very uh, was was honored with uh, the award of the Einstein Prize. He, in fact, was given that prize 
uh, with uh, John Wheeler, the very, the very first uh, 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 Einstein Prize that was given by the American Physical Society. Then I'm going to go into a little bit of uh, Bergman's early life. Uh, I think this is especially appropriate because there are features of that life which, I, which I'm sure played a role uh, in his early formation and the direction in which he went in his later, in his later uh, professional life. A bit about uh, his work in Princeton. Um, I'm, I'm not going to be able, of course, to talk about, uh, about all of his contributions in general relativity, and there, they are many and varied, uh, but I, since um, my own particular interest in, uh, in, in, in fact, the training which I received under Peter Bergman's tutelage, I was, in fact, one of his, one of his PhD students at Syracuse University. I think I was the third from the last to receive a doctoral degree from, from, from him. That was in 1977. Uh, the work, the area in which I worked was, uh, had to do with constrained Hamiltonian formalism. I will tell you a little bit more about that than I will about other domains in which he, which he worked. Um, um, then uh, toward the end of, of the talk, I want to, uh, to move on to the influence that uh, Bergman exercised over the relativity community at large and the role that he played in the formation of a, a larger international collaborations. Um, so first of all, uh, the, the Einstein Prize, as I say, he was the first uh, with John Wheeler to receive this prize that was established in 2003. Um, he was actually notified of, of the award of this prize slightly before his death. So he, he died in, in 2002. Um, and I just read for you, he was given this, this award uh, for pioneering investigations in general relativity, including gravitational radiation, quantum gravity, black holes, space-time singularities, and symmetries in Einstein's equations, and for leadership and inspiration to generations of research in general relativity. And I want to address both of those uh, facts. Um, but um, uh, I, I will start out actually giving you a brief testimony from one of, uh, of Bergman's early collaborators. And this actually is, I'm going to play a couple clips that come from a meeting that we had in Dallas uh, a year ago in which we celebrated the 50th anniversary of, of the Texas Relativistic Astrophysics meeting. And uh, Ted Newman had some very good, very nice things to say about him. Uh, I confess, I spent two hours yesterday trying to figure out a way of, of uh, uh, putting this uh, video in my PowerPoint presentation. I failed, but uh, I think I can fairly easily find it here. So let me see if I can. Uh, oh my. Yes. There's one. And <laughs> sorry for the. Okay. Okay, so here's the first clip. Um, Jim um, Ray Sachs. Uh, well, there's Peter Bergman, who was the most wonderful person, and you can imagine I, I was in love with Peter Bergman. Uh, really, he, he, he imbued us all with a love for physics and decency and honesty uh, above all. Um. And uh, I would uh, would repeat those those uh, that uh, a description of Peter and collaboration with him. But let me let me give you one more uh, brief. Uh, clip from that same meeting. Uh, let's see. I lost it. This one is slightly longer. Um, in '61, I took a sabbatical and I went back to Syracuse. This was a year for me, probably in some sense, the most exciting year of my entire life. That's when uh, I went back to Syracuse. Peter had organized uh, this international group there. Uh, so uh, Andre Troutman was there. I met Andre Troutman uh, uh, for the first time, really. And we Shooking uh, was there. Ray Sachs came back. Uh, Josh uh, w w was, was there. Um, who else we had? Uh, or Ivor Robinson uh, was there. It was just a fabulous set of people. 
And what was remarkable about it is that we all worked and there was no jealousy, there was no backbiting. Everybody told everybody else what they were working on. No one worried about, are you gonna steal my idea? For a matter of fact, many of the ideas were published many, many years later after we never knew even whose ideas frequently were being uh, told about, described. It was, it was a complete mishmash of people telling everybody what, uh, what they were working on. Um, it was a fabulous year, and that's when I interacted very strongly with Roger and we wrote uh, our paper on uh, spin coefficient uh, formalism. Okay, I, I should point out here, I failed to mention this before, that this conversation, this round table, was moderated by Jurgen Wren. Uh, this uh, this uh, tape is actually available online as a uh, YouTube, in case anyone would be interested in downloading it. Let's see. Okay, so let me go into a, 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 some detail uh, about uh, Bergman's early life. So we're starting very early here. I have here a photograph of, of Bergman's uh, grandfather, Solomon Ber Bergman. And this picture was taken in the villa, uh, the Bergman villa in the city of Fürth. Uh, we, we estimate it was made around 1910, although we don't know the precise date. Um, um, Solomon Bergman was a, was a wholesale coal handler in the city of Fürth. Uh, that actually was one of the most vibrant uh, Jewish communities in Germany at the time, uh, situated just outside of the city of Nuremberg. Interesting that it was situated there because Jews were forbidden to stay within that city overnight and they established residence outside the city. Um, I, I don't think Ma Max Bergman, who is uh, Peter Bergman's uh, father is in this picture. Uh, but here is a photograph of, of Max Bergman and an image of Peter Bergman that I suspect none of you have ever seen. Peter Bergman as a young child. Um, Max Bergman uh, was in his own right a, a world recognized scientist. He was in fact in the period from 1920 to 1930 was the leading protein chemist in the world. Uh, and he was appointed a uh, director of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Leather Research in the city of Dresden, a position that he occupied in 1922. Uh, and roughly that same time, uh, Max Bergman split up with his wife, Emmy Bergman, and, and uh, she moved with her son and daughter to the city of Freiburg in 1922. Max Bergman actually was forced to leave Germany in 1933. Fortunately, he was able to find a position uh, at Rockefeller in, uh, Institute uh, in New York City where he could continue his research in organic chemistry, and protein chemistry in particular. Uh, he unfortunately died a very early death of cancer in 1943. Uh, here is Emmy Bergman, uh, actually depicted here with uh, two of her nieces who actually live here in Jerusalem. I was hoping they would in fact be here today, uh, but uh, it turned out they were unable to, to come to, to this event. Um, Emmy Bergman uh, was important in her own right. She was one of the first uh, female pediatricians in Germany. Uh, in fact, uh, she originally had wanted to pursue her degree in medicine in Berlin, but in that time, uh, women were not, per were not uh, uh, permitted to enroll in that program. She had to go to Munich first, and eventually she was able to complete her degree in Berlin. Um, she moved to Freiburg, as I say, um, and um, there she uh, began her practice in uh, 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 medicine for, for children. Uh, but in addition to that, both she and her sister, who, whose name was Clara Grunwald, uh, became interested in, in uh, education. And in particular, they became enamored of the Mo Maria Montessori movement. So both of them actually attended workshops that were conducted by Maria Montessori. Um, Emmy Bergman actually established in Freiburg a, a, um, a school 
um, a boarding school in which uh, she, she uh, uh, educated uh, young children uh, in the Montessori method. Um, it, it, it is uh, fairly obvious that Peter Bergman also benefited from this Montessori uh, training. Um, I do know that he did actually attend an elementary school nearby, uh, but I'm, I'm certain also that, uh, that, he, that he learned some lessons from, uh, particularly in independence, uh, from, from uh, this early training. I wanted to mention, in fact, I meant to, meant to say this when I began, that, that, that of course, since I'm not an historian here, and I'm not in a position to be able to, to uh, yet, to determine what influence all of these, uh, these facts had on, on Peter Bergman's life, I would say that this is, this is definitely an area which deserves further study, to understand what role this Montessori uh, education played in his life. Uh, I have a wonderful instance of one effect of this, of this, uh, of this early training, which actually comes from her, his aunt, so this would be Emmy's sister, uh, who was the actual founder of the Montessori movement in Germany. Uh, she uh, was in Berlin uh, throughout her, her life. Uh, she ended up in a, in a, uh, a, a labor camp for, in, uh, just outside of Berlin from 1941 to 1943, and then from there was transported to Auschwitz where, where she was murdered with with, in fact, uh, other students who were also interned at that camp. She actually wrote letters uh, to a Quaker friend in Holland uh, while she was in this internment uh, camp. And in one of these letters, she refers to her young nephew, who at that time was, well, the time she's referring to, he was 12 years old, and she recounts this tale of Peter having written to her. He was then living in Freiburg and expressing a desire to come and visit her. And she wrote back saying that uh, she didn't have the means to be able to support such a trip. And Peter wrote back saying, well, that's okay. I'll bicycle to Berlin. And he did. It took him three days to bicycle from Freiburg <laughs> to Berlin to early age. Now, there's another individual here that, uh, that I've determined should also be a part of this larger tale. And I also meant to mention that, that one of my longer-term objectives here is, is to uh, to paint a clearer picture of the social, uh, intellectual, cultural background of the Jewish, uh, Jewish intellectuals in the, the Wilhelmian period and also uh, uh, World War I Weimar period in Germany. Uh, and um, I bring up this woman who may be familiar to some of you. Has anyone recognized her, anyone from Germany? Perhaps not, okay. But in fact, she was, she was a, uh, a well-known a TV journalist in post-war Germany. It's a, quite an amazing story because she, she was born in Fürth. Uh, she managed to leave uh, Germany uh, in 1939. Um, she went to the US where she attended Earlham College and then decided, in fact, she had decided even before the war, the, the time she left, that she wanted to return and she wanted to work for peace. Uh, and, uh, and she, and she uh, uh, she did play an important role. Uh, her final uh, position was with uh, ZDF uh, TV network, or, where she was uh, mainly responsible for for news from, from the East. Um, she she tells this wonderful story of her childhood, in which one of her childhood acquaintances, although apparently not a close friend, was a fellow by the name of Heinze Kissinger. Uh, who who uh, was known as the snitch, according to <laughs> according to to the tales that she tells. Of course, we know that he later went on to become uh, uh, a a member of the Nixon administration uh, in in the, in the 1970s. Okay, let me just say a little bit about uh, about uh, Bergman at Princeton. I think most of you know this story that. Um, that his mother actually wrote to, to uh, Einstein uh, when uh, Peter had finished his, his high school education. So that was in 1932, high school in Freiburg. And the mother wrote uh, asking if, if Peter could study physics with, with uh, Einstein. Uh, of course, he, he just graduated from high school, of course. And, um, 
It's curious how she felt uh, in a position to be able to make that sort of inquiry, but it turns out there was already a connection between the Berg, in fact, there were two connections between the Bergman family and, and, and Einstein. One of them was that the, that the house that, uh, the Berg, that Emmy Bergman moved into uh, when they moved to Freiburg uh, was actually owned by the Dukas, Dukas family. And they left, and so the Berg, uh, Emmy Bergman uh, occupied that house at the time the Dukas family moved to Berlin. Of course, I'm, uh, Helen Dukas, as you know, was, was uh, Einstein's secretary. Um, now, and the other thing, of course, is that uh, Peter's father was a, a director of, an, of a Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, and, they, and we do have correspondence between uh, Einstein and, and Max Bergman from, from that period. So um, Emmy Bergman wrote, um, got a response back from Einstein saying, well, no, you know, really, he, he was not in a position to be able to oversee uh, doctoral students. But he did make suggestions about where, where Bergman might, might pursue his doctoral degree. Um, and um, he wanted uh, to go to a German-speaking university. At that time, 1933, uh, he was denied admittance into, into uh, graduate study in Berlin. Uh, and Einstein apparently offered t two possibilities. One would be to go to Switzerland, the other to go to Charles University in, in Prague. Uh, uh, Peter did go to Prague uh, to pursue his degree, uh, and he completed that in 1936. 1936, he himself wrote a letter to Einstein uh, telling him about his PhD work uh, and inquiring whether, in fact, he could get a position as a research assistant with Einstein. Um, um, he, uh, Einstein did not immediately uh, reply. Um, Peter wrote another letter in, in which he, after having completed the thesis, he actually sent a copy. Um, um, well, actually, I, take, I get that back. He did reply, but it took him some time, the first letter. But apparently what Einstein did was inquire with Philip Frank uh, about, about the suitability of, uh, of uh, Peter as a as a research student, and he got a positive response from Frank. Now Peter claims that he didn't know about the first letter, which is that, that his mother had written, which I think is is curious that he'd done this completely on his own. So I wonder how Emmy Bergman uh, communicated the the notion to him that it might be a good idea to go and, to, and pursue his graduate degree in Prague. Um, in going through the Bergman papers just a, a couple of weeks ago, I I came upon. Uh, some photographs, uh, in fact, newspaper clippings, which uh, Peter had, had preserved uh, over the years. And some of these, I think, are familiar to you, but I thought you might enjoy seeing some others that are not so familiar. These actually appeared <coughs> in, in a magazine called Click, uh, which was a weekly photographic magazine. And the, and the, uh, the photographer was pleased to, to, in fact, I thought I had the, the front page of this of this article here. I guess I didn't put it up here, but he was pleased that Einstein let him into, it, into his study and let him accompany uh, Peter on the left, uh, Einstein in the middle, uh, Bargman on the right, uh, during a full day of activities. And so I think this is uh, the group walking to work. Um, here they are, here they are in the office. Um, this, this picture, I think, is perhaps more familiar uh, to, to most of us. Um, this one also. Oh, and I have another, which I, I didn't include here, which shows the three of them uh, walking into the distance uh, from behind. Uh, OK, so um, of course, what, uh, what Bergman did in, in Einstein, the collaboration with uh, what he did in Princeton in the collaboration with Einstein had to do with unified field theory, in particular uh, the innovation which they pursued together, Einstein, Bergman, and Bergman was, was a, a Kaluza-Klein uh, theory in which the fifth dimension was curled up, as we, as we were reminded this morning. Um, so following his uh, stay in, in Princeton, um, he had a temporary position as an assistant professor in a kind of experimental college. So I think this is quite consistent with, with his Montessori training, that he would want to, to, uh, to get some experience in this, 
small liberal arts college environment. Actually, this college is no longer in existence. It was genuinely experimental. Um, and then uh, from 42 to 44, he was an assistant professor at Lehigh University. He did, as did many other physicists in this time, he was involved in the war effort. Uh, he was in particular working in, in uh, underwater sonar, so hydrodynamics. It's quite curious that we have a number of examples of, of, of relativists who made contributions in relativity later on who had this hydrodynamics experience. And uh, Bergman was one of them. He was associated with Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. And then finally, from 1947 to 1982, uh, he uh, began, began his tenure as initially an assistant professor, eventually promoted to full professor at Syracuse University in the physics department. Uh, simultaneously, he had uh, uh, appointments at uh, Yeshiva University in New York City. Uh, I always, I mean, when people hear how he managed to, to occupy positions in both locations at the same time, people are surprised to learn that uh, he actually commuted to Syracuse from New York City. Uh, he, would, he would fly up on Monday morning and return on Wednesday evening. Uh, for he did that for that, this entire period from 1947 to 1942. Okay. So I want to just say a few words about, about his work with general covariance. Um, it's interesting, and uh, it's a bit unexpected. I was at least surprised to learn this, that, that um, uh, Bergman's initial work uh, with looking at singular Lagrangian systems uh, was not, the primary motivation was not to investigate the mathematical properties of these singular systems, but it was to follow up on suggestions uh, from the uh, Einstein's EIH approach. That is, he, he was interested in pursuing this idea of an alternative to, or at least an improvement upon, uh, general relativity, which would incorporate some aspects of, of uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, and the procedure that he used initially uh, was very much like the, the <coughs> einstein intel hoffman procedure, one important element in this, in this uh, approach that very much imitated what had been done by EIH was that he introduced arbitrary parameters into the formalism. Uh, that is, he introduced uh, the space-time coordinates themselves as functions of arbitrary parameters. This actually introduced obstacles into the, into the study of singular systems, which eventually uh, were recognized as unneeded obstacles. Uh, but that took a, a bit of time before, before that occurred. Um, so, he did begin in 1949 uh, to work on general covariance. The, the ultimate objective of, of these studies was to, to try to implement general covariance in a Hamiltonian formulation of general relativity, that is in terms of a, a phase space implementation of general covariance. Uh, but the first step involved looking at some properties of singular Lagrangians like those <coughs> of general relativity, that is Lagrangians, which were invariant under an arbitrary group of, of space-time transformations. And so I'm just laying out here a few of the steps which, which uh, were involved in, <coughs> in, the, in the study. Um, so the first thing that one discovers uh, is that if one looks at second derivatives of, of the Lagrangian density with respect to velocities, with respect to time derivatives of the metric, then one finds that that, that, that resulting matrix is singular uh, and many different uh, properties of singular systems that arise from, from, from this uh, singularity nature. So one of those is that velocities, which means in this case that uh, time derivatives of the metric are not uniquely determined by, by uh, the field equations. Uh, of course, this is intimately related to the fact that, in fact, it, it is a restatement of the fact that uh, uh, ten of the Einstein or four of the Einstein equations are are simply uh, relationships among uh, the metric and and time derivatives of the metric. So, um, in the phase space formulation, that is a statement that that uh, uh, constraints exist uh, between. Uh, the metric and and 
the uh, momenta conjugate to, uh, to the metric. Uh, now, I for a long time thought that this was the beginning of, of formal studies of constrained Hamiltonian systems. Uh, Peter Bergman also thought at the time that this was the beginning of a uh, study of constrained Hamiltonian systems. He was unaware uh, when beginning, in his, at least in the first two publications, that much of this work had already been done by Leon Rosenfeld in, in 1930. Uh, eventually, he became aware of, of that work and, and took it into account and actually cited, and actually cited it in, in his later work. Uh, there are, in fact, some discoveries that, that Rosenfeld made which are still attributed to, to Peter Bergman. Uh, so there are some historical corrections that need to be made. I, I now refer to what has conventionally been called the Dirac or perhaps also Dirac-Bergman procedure as the Rosenfeld-Dirac-Bergman procedure to try to be a little bit more historically accurate. Um, so Bergman did show that, that uh, primary constraints arose. Those, those come about directly because of the existence of, of, this, uh, singular, of this singular Legendre matrix. Um, he worked very closely with students. We've already heard uh, a bit of testimony from from Jim Andrew, or from uh, Ted Newman about about the work of that was going on in the 1950s uh, uh, with uh, with Bergman and, and his students. Uh, Penfield, in fact, was the first to recognize that one could get rid of this parameterized form of general relativity, uh, and um, uh, and that was. Uh, the fact that one could do that was actually discovered by Penfield. And, uh, Penfield, and I have a nice uh, 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 interview discussion with Josh, Josh Goldberg about what the effect of, of this discovery was on, on, on Bergman. Um, perhaps the most significant one of these collaborations uh, was that with Jim Anderson, uh, 1951. It was in that paper that this notion of a secondary and tertiary constraint and so on was, was uh, discovered. I must say, however, rediscovered since uh, Rosenfeld had already done this. On the other hand, this terminology is still attributed to uh, the Bergman, that is, of primary and secondary constraints. Um, we see in this, in this paper the first uh, uh, expression of infinitesimal generators of, of canonical transformations, uh, which are supposed to imitate uh, general coordinate transformations. Um, it's a very, it's a very uh, complicated uh, form that this, that this expression takes and so unwieldy as to be practically useless in, in, in applications, in particular in applications in an eventual quantum theory of gravity. Um, it was also in this period in uh, the 1950s that Bergman began to, uh, to talk about the notion of true observables in quantum field equations in quantum, uh, quantum uh, gravity in particular, his notion of observable was something which uh, was in fact invariant under the action of the diffeomorphism group. He was of course posing this, uh, inventing this notion of, observ of, of observable in a uh, phase-based formulation of general relativity. This is a notion of observable, of course, that is still present today, uh, still widely disputed how to implement it. Uh, and I'll get back to that story in just a moment. Um, the first um, significant uh, progress made in the construction of observables was, in fact, uh, a collaboration done with Ted Newman. This was actually part of his, uh, of his PhD thesis. Um, Ted Newman, however, discounts this work as being uh, not necessarily of great importance, but I think it is an important step uh, in, uh, in attempts at constructing at least classical observables in, in general relativity with the hope that one can eventually promote them to, to quantum operators. Um, I want to say a little bit about the relationship or lack thereof between the work of Bergman and his collaborators in Syracuse in the 1950s with the work that was commenced by, by Arnowit, Dazer, and Misner, actually originally by First paper by Dazer and Misner. I'm uh, sorry, Arnowin and Dazer alone, and then, and then the the second in, in the series of about ten papers by Arnowin, Dazer, and Misner. This is known as the ADM formalism. Um, 
There are very interesting historical questions involved here which have barely been investigated. And this, in fact, this is a, a, a focus of, of current research I'm undertaking with Jurgen and with, with Alex Bloom. Uh, and uh, I must say that when I was a graduate student, I was always surprised at uh, the lack of mention in a large part of the relativity community of the contribution that Bergman himself had made to constrain Hamiltonian dynamics. And, and I, I resolved very early on this is something I wanted to investigate, to try to understand what the historical, or what actually were the, the uh, achievements, independent achievements of each group, uh, what, were the, what were the motivations that led each of these to, to, their, to their research. In the case of Bergman, it's quite clear that, that he took the geometrical uh, picture of general relativity quite seriously, uh, in particular the coordinate independence of, of, of uh, eventual physical variables in, in this model. Um, that is to be contrasted, however, with the approach of, of Deser and Arnowin in particular, and then eventually joined by Misner, they come from a different tradition. Uh, Arnowit and, and Deser were, were students, doctoral students of, of, of Sw Julian Swinger at Harvard. Uh, they modeled their original investigation of a first order formulation of general relativity on Swinger's uh, uh, quantum action principle. And it's interesting to note that in their first paper, their first joint paper, they proposed uh, that within, in the context of this, of this first order formalism, that in order to make physical sense of the resulting theory, they would have to impose coordinate conditions. But beyond that, they did not investigate, they did not think it worthwhile to investigate um, what would be the consequence of imposing different coordinate conditions, or is there a sense in which the, the formalism that they ended up with actually, actually exhibits a invariance under, under the action of the general four-dimensional diffeomorphism group. Um, just to give you some indication of, of uh, Deser's attitude, I've cited here uh, a, uh, a statement that he made to, to myself and to Dean Rickles in an in a interview that we conducted uh, at Caltech in 2011. So Dick Arnowit and I, Charlie Misner, of course, had his foot in both camps. So this is geometrical versus versus what I think we would refer to now as the covariant approach. Uh, we're strongly anti-geometrical as we felt that Riemann was clearly a corrupting influence on Einstein. Now it's, it's really quite curious how, how large in effect this, this point of view of, of Deser and Arnowin in particular, how large an effect it has had on su subsequent developments in in efforts at producing a quantum theory of gravity. And, and I'll, I'll, re I'll return to, to this question. So um, um, I want to go over a, a little bit of ground here, which I know will be familiar to, to most, if not all of you, but it has to do with, with uh, difficulties that arise when one attempts to formulate or to realize a general uh, four-dimensional diffeomorphism covariance at a Hamiltonian level. Uh, and uh, I spelled out in some detail here the difficulty that arises. And in fact, uh, it's this particular difficulty that, uh, that uh, Bergman refers to in that paper that I displayed to you at the beginning of the lecture, the, the address that he gave here in 1979. So we consider two su successive infinitesimal uh, coordinate transformations with objects that I'll call descriptors, the epsilon here, uh, and you compose them and then take the difference. In other words, you form the commutator, getting what we would recognize as the Lie algebra of, of this group. And it turns out here, the mu's and the nu's, of course, range over from zero to, to three. It turns out here, of course, one gets time derivatives of the descriptors uh, in, in this algebra. And uh, if you persist in, in continuing to to form commutators of this algebra, then you can see quite easily that you're going to get higher and higher order time derivatives of the descriptor if you're trying to implement uh, this algebra uh, yeah, uh, at, at, in, in, within phase space. Well, what would the implications of that be? Well, uh, if you're having higher and higher time derivatives, that must mean that you, you would be dealing with a set of generators, which would be a sum of terms uh, 
of derivatives of these descriptors of higher and higher powers multiplying, multiplying the constraints. Uh, of course, that is not what happens in the general theory. And, um, um, oops, sorry, the head here. So, um, Bergman and his group in, in Syracuse in the 50s were quite concerned with, with, with this difficulty. They did not have a solution. And one of, the, one of the observations that Bergman makes in this 1979 paper is that it was actually Dirac who, who solved this problem. Um, and the, the manner in which he solved it, um, uh, in fact, I guess I, I have this here. We'll, I think I'll, I'll, I'll read this. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. So during the early 50s, those of us interested in the Hamiltonian formulation of general relativity were frustrated by a recognition that no possible canonical transformations of the field variables could mirror four-dimensional coordinate transformations in their commutators, not even at the infinitesimal level. And that's where we were just concentrating our attention. That is because infinitesimal or finite canonical transformations deal with the dynamical variables on a three-dimensional hypersurface. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, deal with uh, a three-dimensional hypersurface, a Cauchy surface, and the commutator of two such infinitesimal transformations must be an infinitesimal transformation of the same kind. However, the commutator of two infinitesimal diffeomorphisms involves not only the data on a three-dimensional hypersurface, but their time derivatives as well. If these data be added to those drawn on initially, then in order to obtain first-order time derivatives of the commutator, one requires second-order time derivatives of the two commu co commuting diffeomorphisms, and so forth. So the algebra simply does not close. So that was a difficulty that uh, was faced uh, in the 50s. Uh, so even though one had the beginning of expressions for canonical generators for these, for these uh, 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 diffeomorphism uh, transformations within phase space, uh, one uh, faced this, this uh, apparently insurmountable obstacle. Um, so of course, the higher and higher derivatives would mean that one would actually end up with a theory which would be non-local in, in time. Uh, now, this actually is a, a property that persists to some extent in the solution which was first found by, by Dirac, but then, but then interpreted by Bergman and by his, by his collaborator, Art Komar. So the solution which, which Dirac found was that uh, one should deal not with, with descriptors, which depend exclusively on the space-time coordinates, but the, these descriptors should contain a compulsory dependence on uh, uh, some of the components of the metric tensor, namely the lapse and shift. So, in fact, the precise form that Dirac suggested was that, that, that one should decompose arbitrary di infinitesimal diffeomorphisms as those that are tangent to the uh, original space-like surface and those that are perpendicular to it. Oh, my goodness. Okay. All right. Okay. So... Um, so this results in a, in a new algebra, and the critical uh, aspect of this particular algebra is that it involves, it involves the metric, namely the, these E's here are the, are the inverses of the three metric. So what are the implications? You can see actually from this picture that, that since derivatives appear in this algebra, if you perform the same sort of operation I was describing earlier, then you're going to end up with with uh, an algebra which involves higher and higher powers of this three metric. So it's necessarily a, a, a transformation group uh, which uh, in its general case will depend non-locally on the metric itself, that non-locally spatially on the metric. Okay, all right. Okay, so that's the point I make here. Um, um, now, this actually led uh, Bergman and Komar to introduce a new group, which has become known as the Bergman-Komar group. It's understood now that uh, if you are attempting to, you cannot implement or realize uh, diffeomorphisms uh, uh, in the original form. That is, you have to you have to require that that the uh, that these descriptors and therefore also the finite uh, diffeomorphisms have to depend on the metric that lives on that particular uh, space-time manifold. Uh, so the nature of the implementable or realizable group has, has, has changed. And this is a, a point that was made by, by uh, Komar and Bergman in a paper they published in 1972. We already see aspects of this al already in 
in Bergman's uh, Handbuch der Physik, uh, discussion of general relativity in 1962, one has to carefully distinguish between time evolution and, and uh, general covariance in this model. And, and this is a lesson, in fact, I'm uh, sorry to admit, uh, uh, to observe, has not entirely been, been accepted by the relativity community. And one aspect of this is uh, a, a, an interpretation that, that uh, is widely popular still within the relativity community, and that is something called uh, multi-finger time, a notion that was invented by, by Kukac. Um, in fact, what one is doing in making that assertion and that understanding is that one is conflating two different properties, one time evolution on the one hand and symmetry on the other hand. Okay, I'm... I'm uh, well, in fact, I, I, consistent with the title here, I think it's appropriate for me to read this, this uh, note, which, uh, which Bergman also makes in that article. So given a Cauchy surface with two different sets of permissible Cauchy data imposed upon it, and one of Dirac's mappings, so this is one of these transformations, then a particular point of that Cauchy surface identified by its coordinate triplet will be mapped on two different points. In other words, the map of a given point depends on the assumed metric as derivatives. Right? So. Uh, Realizable diffeomorphisms must must depend on what lives on on the manifold. Of course, this is actually very closely related to ideas that were, that were first uh, we've we've seen attributed very early on to Einstein uh, that that space time itself uh, uh, has has no meaning without without uh, uh, either material or metric fields that live on the manifold. So I would I would uh, cite this as one of the lasting contributions of Bergman, one one whose one whose implications are still being still being pursued. Okay, um, I'm going to jump ahead here, and we'll I I won't talk about uh, uh, some of the later work here, excepting to say that that uh, Bergman and Komar did propose one method of of producing observables, and that was to use a sort of coincidence argument that uh, Einstein first produced in, in, in his initial response to general covariance. Uh, that is namely the whole argument. Uh, and his response, the way in which he got around it was to recognize that one could give a sense to space-time events uh, as intersections of particle trajectories or now more generally as uh, using information about uh, or landmarks of space-time which can be constructed from knowledge of the metric itself. Okay, let me say a little bit about the gravitational axis, so I'll go through this rather quickly. We, we have uh, already saw uh, Ted Newman's uh, account of, of what happened in the excitement of the period of 1961, but this is just a partial list of, of relativists who uh, were either students of Peter Bergman or passed through uh, Syracuse uh, in that period from 1950s to 1960s. Most everyone who was anyone in this period uh, uh, is on that list. Um, they worked on a variety of different topics. Um, generally, they were grouped into two distinct groups, uh, Bergman, Goldbar, Sachs, and Newman in one, Bondi, Pirani, Troutman, Penrose, Robinson in the other. The second group mainly was concerned with, with problems in gravitational radiation, uh, classification, classification of vial tensor, uh, Peeling theorem, Goldman Sachs theorem, all, all, all arose uh, in, this, in this context. Um, Here's a, a photograph that was actually given to us by Jim Anderson in uh, another interview that Dean Rickles and I conducted, which is a photograph of, of, a, of, of one of the meetings of the Stevens uh, uh, meetings that took place from roughly the 19, mid-1950s when Anderson, after he, have, he had completed his degree, um, Dean has made some progress in identifying many of the individuals here, but I think one person you can make out almost clearly here is Peter Bergman right here in the middle. Uh, but we were, we were astounded to learn of the nature of the interactions that occurred pr pretty much along the entire eastern seaboard at this time in the 1950s and 1960s. So this, this is an important, relatively unexplored aspect of the history of general relativity. A um, little bit about, uh, about Bergman's uh, influence in the creation of uh, international general relativity community. Uh, um, he was a co-founder with Andre Mercier of the International Committee on General Relativity and Gravitation. I don't know the precise dates here. I think we can attribute the beginnings of this committee to uh, the post-Burn uh, meeting, 1955. 
Uh, I've, I don't know if you can read there, but I've actually, from, uh, from letters which I found in the Berg Bergman archive, I have at least a partial list or lists of some of the persons who, who were appointed by earlier members of the committee. So this is pretty much a self-selected group. But one thing that's quite impressive about this is its international nature. Um, Bergman, of course, was involved in all of those early GRG meetings, beginning with Chapel Hill in 1957. Uh, he he actually gave he actually gave uh, the uh, uh, summary arguments uh, of the conferences uh, in in uh, Chapel Hill uh, in Royaumont, which was the second of these meetings, and also in the Warsaw meeting in in 1962. Um, uh, he was also involved as one of the organizers of the first Texas Relativistic Astrophysics meeting in 1963, and I have here. Uh, you can read a little bit of this. This is a this is uh, a a public announcement that was made by him uh, at the APS meeting in New York in 1964, reporting on on this on this first meeting and the implications of the discovery of quasars and the understanding of the role of general relativity in the creation of, of, of condensed uh, objects, which were uh, one of which was presumed to be uh, quasars, which had just been discovered. A um, little bit about, I think I'm almost through here, so I'll, I'll be just telling you. So international community building and diplomacy. Um, um, he was involved in the organization of all of these early meetings, but I thought I would just tell you a little bit uh, with, uh, about uh, the GR5 meeting, which took place in Tbilisi, Russia, in 1968, uh, there actually were difficulties that arose in the in the planning uh, and and uh, implementation of, of this meeting. Um, um, I think. Let me just read a little bit uh, about this. Um, this, this letter, which was written by Bergman to Bondi in 1968, is a response to difficulties that Asha Perez and Nathan Rosen were having in, in receiving an invitation to go to, to this meeting. Uh, eventually, uh, Perez did get an invitation, but it was too late for him to go, and, and he never did receive a visa to be able to go. Uh, Rosen himself also did not go to this meeting. Um, and um, so Bergman wrote to Bondi uh, asking for his assistance in dealing with, with this question. I have here a photograph of Bergman here in, in, uh, uh, in Israel uh, with Nathan Rosen. I don't know the precise date of this. I would guess it's around 1972. Uh, I don't know the, the, the date. Um, then I have uh, a letter from Bondi to Fock. Uh, in which Bondi announces that he's not going to go to the Tbilisi uh, conference because of the exclusion of Israeli scientists in the meeting. Um, but that isn't actually the, the, the final story because it turns out um, um, 1968 was also the year of, of uh, the uh, uh, invasion of, of uh, Czechoslovakia and uh, it turned out there were a number of scientists uh, who, were, who were opposed to participating in this meeting as, as, a, as a statement of principle against this, against this invasion. And in fact, this is a, a note that was sent out by the chair, uh, the secretary, Mercier at this time, in which he says, in view of armed intervention in Czechoslovakia, I shall not come to Tiflis. Tiflis. In my opinion, conference should be postponed until 1969. Now, the conference did actually take place, uh, but there were some consequences uh, uh, in terms of organization of GRG itself. Um, this was still a period in which uh, there was only a self-appointed international committee. Uh, the GRG society itself was founded in 1971, and Peter also played an important role in that formation. But this is a letter that he sent to members of this, of this committee uh, and he says, I won't read the entire thing. Uh, we cannot help being affected by these events as citizens of our respective countries and as responsible individuals concerned with the survival of the human race. As we are members of an international scientific committee, perhaps we can contribute to the well-being of the human race best by keeping intact the channels of international communication, of international friendship that are as yet available to us. Uh, and I, I cite this. 
uh, attitude and his attempts at at, uh, organ at at creating an organization that could overcome these political obstacles as one of his very important uh, contributions to the development uh, and, and, and continued life of, of this international society. Okay, that's all I want to say. Sure, sure, okay. I promised you, Mima, that I shall dispatch all of you by seven. So there is room for one <laughs> telegraphic style question. And plenty of opportunity later, of course, right? Of course. So thank you, Donna.